Hi, we're looking at care of the unconscious patient. There's a couple of things that I wanted to sort of talk about before I unleash you on the rest of the team. Um, look, last week Jodie spoke about airway and compromised airway and all the rest of it. And she did talk about the tongue. So I kind of just want to explore that a little bit further with you. So with the tongue, what do we know about the tongue? The tongue's a muscle and the tongue is fused to the mandible. So that means that anything that we do to the mandible, we're going to do to the tongue. And so when it comes to an unconscious patient, something like 80% or even higher is, um, is caused by an obstruction of the tongue just relaxing and where it goes. So with that in mind, it kind of makes sense when we're actually talking about how to actually manage the airway of a patient that is unconscious. And really, Anything I do to the mandible, I'm going to do to the tongue. So if I do a jaw thrust and pull the tongue forward, I'm creating a vortex. And sometimes patients that are unconscious will actually start breathing again if I just create a vortex and they'll actually start to get a patent airway. Of course, if they're not breathing anymore, we need to actually occupy that vortex with something that the team's actually gonna to talk to you about later. So I just want you to think about the tongue and sort of how it sort of works and its relationship with the jaw and where it goes. When we actually fill the vortex with these devices that you're gonna be talking about, where does the tongue go? The tongue goes anterior. In fact, this area here is probably one of the most anterior parts of your body and that's where the tongue sort of goes. So we're pushing it forward, you're not rolling it to the side. A lot of people thought that that's what we did when we actually um, put, put something inside the vortex we created. That's not the case. So um, yeah, I just want you to start thinking about the tongue and the jaw and therefore whatever you do to the jaw, you do to the tongue. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna talk now about airway assessment and airway maneuvers and airway adjuncts. So we're going to presume that we've come across our unconscious patient and we need to first assess their airway. So when we're looking at a patient's airway, we see if there's any secretions or anything we need to clear. You may need to use a tongue depressor to help you with um, directly visualize the airway. And then you can use a yanker sucker and suction out any secretions that you might see. In a smaller patient or a patient that might have some trismus or something like that, you might consider using a softer Y suction catheter mm -hmm. um, that also att attaches to your low wall suction. And again, under direct visualization with a tongue depressor, you would suction any secretions that you see. Don't do finger, um, blind finger sweeps or anything like that because you can cause damage to the soft palate. And also if there's a foreign body, you can further push it down the airway. So once we've done that, if clearing secretions hasn't helped, then we, we would consider doing either a head tilt chin lift where we stabilize the patient's head and lift the chin to help open up the airway. And if that doesn't work, we can do what's called a jaw thrust where we push up the mandible. And as John explained earlier, the tongue is attached to the mandible and it will move out of the way. If doing those maneuvers does, doesn't help, we can then um, call for help because obviously we're still holding mm -hmm. on to the jaw. So I'll call for help and I'll ask Sondos to come and help me. And we will to think about putting in an airway adjunct. So <clears> the first <throat> airway adjunct that we might consider using is a nasopharyngeal airway. <laughs> so as simple as just going through the nostril, putting it straight down if it does go down. as far as we can go so if I, <clears throat> normally they'll go straight down there, there we, we go. go we're in so that's the first one if that again doesn't work we'll move on to the next one but this is an easy access if you can't uh, maintain the airway like Jill is doing throw this down and this will be up you can bag the patient with the nasopharyngeal but let's say in this case it doesn't do anything for the patient we'll get a Goodell's out Normally you have about four colours that you use, four different sizes and colours. Um, we'll use the red one, which is normally the average size for an adult. I just measure it up quickly in a research situation, just like that, it'll go straight through. All right, make sure the tongue is out of the way. So we make sure it's like that. Twist, get the tongue out of the way and straight down. This is when I can then get the bag valve and start bagging. Okay, so good seal. I've got Jill assisting here. I'll do a nice jaw thrust. Let's just do a normal seal. We're looking for chest rise, rise and, and fall. fall. And I can't see anything right now. So 
It just means I need to do a nice lift with the jaw and see if we can maintain. Hang on, let me just get. How does that look, Jodie? You're getting some chest rise and fall? No. Just making sure that we've got a good CE grip. There we go. And if that's not adequate, what's our next step? Um, so if that this we're not adequately bagging the patient, I'll be also looking at the patient's vital signs. So with their oxygen sats, if we're not getting any having any difference in their oxygen levels, which would try and get a significant rise in this time, I would consider another form of airway. So I'll get Jill to take over. Got a laryngeal uh, here. Make sure it's deflated put, what, when you're going to put it in. Um, and I'll just show you the quick way to put it down and then we'll try and bag. Okay, Jill, just let me come in. So just quick, if you've got a blade, get a blade just to assist, straight down. So remember you're not gonna hurt the patient. And just inflate the balloon and we bag. This is a temporary airway, so the next step I would do if I need a secure airway for a longer period of time is I'd get an ETT tube ready for intubation. But we can keep bagging the patient till we've got everything set up. So this gives us a bit more time to prepare for, with the intubation team. Thanks. Okay, so we've come across a patient who is potentially unconscious. We're going to assess them for response as um, part of our Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, so we might start peripherally because we don't know this patient. So we might say, John, John, and maybe touch their foot or uh, touch their hand and say, John, can you hear me? As you get closer, John, can you hear me? You know they're not going to punch you out. John, can you hear me? You get no response. So we used to teach to do a sternal rub. We don't do that so much anymore because of the complications that can arise from multiple people doing sternal rub. So now we teach to do a squeeze of the trap, a squeeze of the trapezium muscle, or an intraorbital, applying intraorbital pressure up here under the um, orbit of the eye. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate uh, assessment of pupillary reaction and size. So when we look at our patient, if they haven't got their eyes open, then we would need to open their eyes. And then we shine a light, bringing it in from the side and looking at the, the reaction of the pupil. So this pupil is going probably from a size five to a size four when we assess. And then we come over to the other side and it's reacting in the same way at the same speed and going from a size five to a size four. So we would say then that this patient had pupils that were equal and reactive to light. So when we're assessing patients' um, pupillary reaction and size, then we can bring our light in and observe this patient's eye going from a size five to a size four, but it's a sluggish reaction. Very slow reaction to light. Okay, so in regards to assessing a GCS, I wanted to talk to you about assessment of motor response. So a patient who's going to score six on your GCS for motor will, will obey commands, will do exactly what you ask them to do. They might make a fist or stretch their arms out or do something like that for you. A patient who will score a five will um, localise to pain. So they will, if you pinch them, they'll move away. A patient who would score a four would flex um, or withdraw from pain, so they would move away from the painful stimuli. Where it gets tricky is when you start seeing a patient who's posturing. So a patient who won't score a, a score of three will be posturing in a decorticate way. And decorticate means to bring, um, so it's abnormal flexion, so in towards the core. So their feet and their arms might be turned in towards the core of their body. And to score a two um, is a patient who is decerebrate posturing, who might extend away. So they flick their arms and their legs out and extend in a decerebrate posture.
and then to score a one, there's no response at all. Guys, I wanted to talk to you about the Glasgow Coma Scale today and how to do it. Usually in class, um, you might turn to the person next year and do a Glasgow Coma Scale, and I don't think that that is an overall uh, useful um, way of actually assessing the Glasgow Coma Scale. So I just kind of wanted to talk to you about how how I sort of go through it. So if I was to do a Glasgow Coma Scale on somebody that's wide awake, say a student in my class, their eyes would be open and they would score a four. Okay, they would be answering uh, questions that I might ask them and I'd be very confident that they're sort of with it, they'd be able to tell me about you know, where they are, what time it is and all that sort of stuff. And as far as the motor response, they'll be able to follow instructions and squeeze my hand. And so that's how this sort of works. We look at the patient's behaviour and they score, this normal patient would score a 15. Now I want to do the Glasgow Coma Scale on a doorstop and I've called the doorstop Hoddor for your Game of Thrones fans. So I'm going to ask this to open their eyes. Can you please open your eyes? No, they still score a 1. Can you please tell me where you are? No. Okay, they're going to score one for that. And can you squeeze my hand? No. And they're going to score one for that. And then they're going to score a three. And a dead person can score a three. Now I want you to think about somebody that's just drank too much. So, you know that person. You've probably been there. Okay? Just think back on somebody that was just too extra with the alcohol. Were their eyes open? No. So they're not going to score a four. Were their eyes closed? Um, and maybe they responded to you talking to them. Let's say no. Let's say they responded to some noxious stimuli, which to a person that's had too much alcohol might be something like shaking them or whatever. Very noxious. So I'm going to give them, say, a two for that. In terms of their voice, you know, would they be orientated? Maybe not so much. They couldn't drive a car. Would they be, I don't know, so with the, with the verbal response, would they be slightly confused? Maybe. So they wouldn't score a five, let's give them a four. Now in terms of their motor skill, would they follow instructions? No, not the person I've got in mind. Would that person localise to pain and move away? Maybe. So they wouldn't score a six, I might give them a five. So let's add that up, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And now I'm gonna talk about a neuro patient. And this is where the Glasgow Coma Scale becomes actually very useful. A patient with a neurological condition could come into the emergency department and say, hi. And you'd go, okay, well, they're with us. I can give them a four. I can ask them, do you know where you are? So what if this neuro patient said, yes, I know where I am, I'm at Campbelltown Hospital. Um, do you know your name? Yes, tells you their name. Do you know what year it is? And the patient says, yeah, it's 1992. They're not orientated. And I wouldn't give them a five. I'd probably give that patient a four. And that patient could very well execute some motor response. They could squeeze my hand. I may find some variation in the strength of each limb or maybe on one side or another, and I may not. And I might give this patient a six. And I'll add that up, and this patient gets a 14. And this is the interesting about Glasgow Coma Scale. This patient is normal. This patient is dead. This patient really needed some fluids, some Vegemite, and needed to sleep it off. And this patient here will probably have neurosurgery. So the point I'm trying to make with Glasgow Coma Scale it is formulated around a numerical profile based on behaviour and response. But the numerical profile and subtotal is useless without you explaining why the patient scored what they did. And that's really what I wanted to sort of talk about Glasgow Coma Scale. I hope you find that helpful.